As an industrial water treater, you have to do so much. You have to know about so many things. Chemistry, physics, environmental, electrical, and the list goes on. But did you ever think that list should include cyber protection? Who's got time for that? Well, hackers have plenty of time to find your vulnerabilities and hold your valuable information hostage. 43% of all cyber attacks happen to small businesses. Small businesses are not prepared to defend against cyber attacks. The cyber threat protection experts at Reinhardt Consulting Group have been helping water treatment companies with strategies to protect their valuable data. Here's the thing about Reinhardt Consulting Group. They understand what water treatment companies need to defend against these attacks. From training to software, Reiner Consulting Group is your one-stop shop for protecting your valuable data. After all, where would you be without your data? Go to scalinguph2o.com forward slash cyber to find out more. That's scalinguph2o.com forward slash cyber. Don't wait before it's too late. Welcome to the Scaling Up H2O podcast, the podcast where we scale up on knowledge so we don't scale up our systems. I'm Trace Blackmore, the host of the Scaling Up H2O podcast. And Nation, how the heck is it that we are almost out of 2022? Wow, I always think the years go quickly. Of course, this year was not without all of the trials and tribulations that it seems like we just have every year. It's like, hey, what what can go different next? And Father Time just throws that at us. We're always getting something new to deal with it. But here's the cool thing. Unlike other people, people like you, the Scaling Up Nation that listen to podcasts like this, that try to find out what you don't know that you need to know, you are able to weather the storm better. In fact, most of the water treatment companies that I talked to at the Association of Water Technologies convention this year shared with me that they are better off today than they were five years ago. And let's look at all the things that have happened in five years. Folks, we endured, we continue to endure a pandemic. And the water treatment industry is taking that in strides. We are learning how to get better. We are repositioning what we are learning and we are getting through that storm, and we are better for it. Speaking for myself, my company here, Blackmore Enterprises, we have learned so many lessons that we are now a stronger company. Now, I have to say, we've got a lot more issues. I mean, it's hard to find things still. We're paying more for things. It's harder to to get them once you find them. Of course, we're all dealing with that, but everybody's dealing with that. It's the companies that know how to navigate that, and they're not reacting. They're trying to take a proactive approach to all these issues. And let's face it, if you're in business, if you're alive on this planet, you are always going to have issues. It's what you do with those issues. It's how you learn from those issues. It's how you pick yourself back up when you have those issues that defines what your future is. Let's face it. You can't change the past, but you can learn from the past. And when you learn from the past, you can definitely direct your future. And Nation, you are going to meet somebody today. And I say meet, you've actually heard him on this podcast before. He's been on at least three times before. And he is by far one of my most trusted coaches, mentors, friends. You attach whatever label you can to it. He has helped me so much. I can't wait to bring him on. But before I do, Here is a brand new Thinking on Water with James. Welcome to Thinking on Water with James, the segment where we don't give you the answers, we give you the topics and questions for you to think about, drop by drop. 
Now let's get to it. In this week's episode, we're thinking about mixing acid and water together. If you get this wrong, it can be quite dangerous and destructive. Should you mix acid and water or vice versa? What happens when you mix acid and water together? What's the worst case that can occur if you get this wrong? What concerns could you have with feeding acid to a cooling tower, upstream of an RO, or other applications? Seriously, take this week to think about the proper way of mixing acid and water together and how acid should be fed in various applications. Your safety and that of those around you may depend upon it. Be sure to follow hashtag TOW22 and hashtag ScalingUpH2O to share your thoughts on each week's Thinking on Water. I'm James McDonald, and I look forward to learning more from you. Well, James, as always, thank you for helping us think. And Scaling Up Nation, I am so excited to reintroduce you to one of my most trusted mentors. Scaling Up Nation, I'm so excited to introduce my lab partner today, a great friend, a mentor, a coach, Tim Fulton. Welcome to the Scaling Up H2O podcast. Thank you, Trace. Great to be back with you. Yeah, you were one of my first guests. What were you, episode 20, 21, 22? I should have looked these things up. I should be a much better host. You deserve so much better. (laughs) So Nation, Tim and I have known each other. We were at the Rising Tide Mastermind live event just uh, about two months ago, and we were doing the math, and we were both appalled to find out it was approaching 15 years we've known each other. We were kids. You and I met because a good friend of mine, he introduced me to you, and he said that you put on this MBA-like program boot camp, and I had to attend this. It was the best class that I think I have ever attended, and I'm so glad that he gave me the recommendation. And uh, you're getting ready to do another one of those. What is this, like number 50 that you've done? Do you keep track of all the classes you've done? No, I I keep track more of the number of graduates, and I think we're over 3,000 graduates, business owners who have been through either what started off as the Grow Smart program for the Small Business Development Centers uh, through UGA here in Atlanta. And then uh, 10 years ago, I started doing that same training uh, under the Small Business Matters umbrella. And uh, I've been doing that now. This is the 10th year for that. I was under the Grow Smart when you did that. And I didn't want it to be over. And I remember when we had our last class, is it eight sessions you do? It was eight or 10. I may, might have been 10 half day sessions then. Yeah. So after number 10, I was just thinking, how am I going to get more information that I didn't know I didn't know? And by the way, you put that phrase in my head, and I have just been obsessed with that ever since I heard it. How do I learn what I don't know I need to learn? And that's what your boot camp taught me. And you and I spoke. And then you uh, encouraged me to join Vistage, of which you were the chair of. If people are listening and never heard of Vistage, how would you describe that? Sure. Vistage was the very first CEO peer group program. Started here in the U.S. It's now been uh, around for about 60 years. There are almost 30,000 members worldwide now. Uh, start off as as primarily a peer group for CEOs of small, mid-sized companies. Now they've got programs not only for the CEOs, but for the key executives and the the emerging leaders. But it's it's the largest today, the largest peer group organization for business leaders uh, in the world. And you call it a peer group, but I always looked at it as a mastermind. It was a bunch of people coming together for the sole purpose of how do we make each other better? And there was a specific agenda that you would follow each and every month. You, of course, would give us so much information for us to take home and continue learning after the meeting was over. But somebody always presented an issue or they presented what was going on with their company. And then the other nine members got to tear it apart in a very carefrontational way. And that's a word that I learned from you. We want to give people the information that they need to hear, but it might be hard for them to hear it. And I've been a, well, I'm not anymore, but I was a Vistage member for just shy of 10 years. 
And my company would not be anywhere near where it is today had I not gotten all of that help from my peers. You know, the peer group experience, you know, when Vistage first got started, it was it was unique. There weren't groups like that then. Today, and, and I'm going to use mastermind group, peer group, because I think they're very similar. Uh, there are lots of different types of groups available today, whether it's through Vistage, Trace, you've got several mastermind groups, chambers of commerce, industry groups. And the idea is really, you know, what we've learned over time is there's just so much one that can be learned from being a part of a group like this. Why go alone? You know, it's you know one of the most common things I hear from business owners is it's lonely at the top, right? I'm having to make all these decisions by myself. I don't have anyone to share sometimes the good news or the bad news. Wouldn't it be nice to have you know a group of peers that I could talk to about just the the issues that I've got, the decisions that I've got, and that's where uh, uh, a Vistage group or a, a mastermind group comes in. Also provides a level of accountability for members, so that you know Trace, if you show up at a meeting and say, you know what, I'm I've got this this terrorist working for me, I I, I need to let this person go. I'm going to do it by next week. Well, now you have 12 other people that have heard you say that and are going to hold you accountable for that decision. And so it just brings a whole different level of accountability for business owners who, in some cases, don't always have that accountability on their own. So, you know, over time, I've become a, a, certainly a big fan of groups, mastermind groups, because I've just I've seen it work. I've seen it work. Tim, you were one of the people that really encouraged me to start the Rising Tide Mastermind. It was about four years ago. You and I met at a Chick-fil-A, and we decided we were both going to start mastermind groups. Yeah, and, and uh, you know, all the great ideas come from you know, lunch at Chick-fil-A. I'm, <laughs> I'm, I'm certain, certain of that. Trace, knowing you and, and knowing not only on, an, on the intellectual side, but on the emotional side, I just I thought you'd be great at this, and, and, you, and you have been. Uh, and the evidence is, you know, the number of groups and number of members that you've gotten. I don't think it's something that everyone is equipped to do. It, I think it takes a, a particular DNA, so to speak, you know, for someone to want to be a facilitator for for these groups. Uh, uh, but I know, you know, I, I continue to enjoy it today, and it's great to see how much how much fun you're having with it as well. Well, I really appreciate the encouragement and uh, scaling up nation. For your information, Tim and I get together on a regular basis, and one of the things we talk about is how can we help each other's mastermind groups. And Tim's also one of those people that hold me accountable to do the things that I say that I'm going to do. And Tim, I really appreciate that because I know the Rising Tide Mastermind is far better because you are in my corner. Well, thank you. You're very generous. Well, speaking of the Rising Tide Mastermind, you were so gracious with your time. You were, we, we have reverse keynotes. So we put our keynotes on the very last day and you closed us out this past live event. And so many people got so much great information from what you shared with us. And what you shared with us was Talent Matters, and everybody loved it. I wanted to bring you on the Scaling Up H2O podcast so we could share with the Scaling Up Nation what you shared with the Rising Tide Mastermind. Well, thank you, Trace. I I enjoyed speaking at your event. They were a very attentive group, despite, I don't know what you all did the night before, but uh, I could tell they were were a little little exhausted that morning, but they just seemed to perk up and they were a lot of fun. They asked a, a number of really good questions and were quite a, quite attentive. Well, since you brought it up, what we did the night before was called Whirly Ball. And the way I can ex- describe Whirly Ball is it's lacrosse meets bumper cars. And everybody just they beat each other up with these bumper cars. It was the most fun we've ever had, but we paid the price the next morning. Yeah. But again, they were, they were, they all showed up and they were engaged, you know, for, and for the, the presentation and maybe in part because of the topic, you know, Trace, I'm not sure that we have, you and I have ever lived in a, a more interesting time when it comes to leading and managing employees and or a more difficult time to lead and, and manage pe- and employees and, and engage employees. So it, we're in rare air right now, I think, when it comes to talent. 
everybody is trying to hire talent and hardly anybody can find it. So I think that's why your podcast episode is going to be so timely because how do we keep the people that we have so we don't need to find people we can't find? Yeah, so you know, I'm sure many of your listeners have heard, you know, the great resignation. I think it's 40 million employees over a course of about 12 months left their jobs uh, last year. Some retired, some took a sabbatical, some decided to take different jobs, but we've never seen such movement in the labor market in, in modern times. And so, you know, what's on the mind, I know of many business owners is, you know, A, how do I find good people? But maybe equally important is how do I retain my people, particularly my best employees? How do I keep them? And what is it that they want? And that's, you know, what we really focused on at your event was the idea of what is it that employees want? And what's, what's interesting is in that regard, nothing has changed over the, you know, the last 20 or 30 years. While we might think as we have different generations in the workplace today, that, you know, their, their, their motivation is different, their expectations are different. But according to the research, not much has changed in that regard. And what I, what I cited for your group was the, the Gallup. Uh, study that was done over 20 years ago, led primarily by their CEO, Marcus Buckingham. And it was based on that research that he wrote uh, his best selling book, Breaking All the Rules. And in that book, he shares what were, according to the research, one of the largest research projects ever done by Gallup, the 12 questions that matter most to employees. Again, this was over 20 years ago 12 questions that matter most. And certainly they were relevant at the time, but you know what's interesting is that they Gallup did the almost the exact same study a little over two years ago. Trace, just imagining that certainly over twenty years, much would have changed in terms of what employees want, and quite to the opposite, what they found is the exact same twelve questions were at the top of minds of employees today. Nothing has changed in terms of what employees want from their employers. So I know we don't have you know time today to go through all 12, but if you'd like, I'd be happy to hit on just a couple of them that I think would be most interesting to your listeners. I would love if you did that, Tim. Okay. So you know the, they were listed in the book uh, in order of importance. There's a hierarchy to these 12 questions they found, uh, some more important than others, but at the top of the list, number one, what employees said is, tell me what you expect. Let me know where, uh, translated, you know, what, what's most important to you as my boss, as, as the company I'm working for, what is it that you expect from me? You know, clear, ex, clear expectations. And I think what they were saying there is how high is the bar? You want me as a salesperson to bring in half a million dollars in sales? Are you expecting a million dollars in sales? Maybe $5 million in sales. But help me understand where the bar is. What, what are your expectations? And from this, you know, hopefully most companies go about developing a job description for every position in the company, a job description that says, Trace, this is your job. Here's are the, here are the results that we expect. Here are our expectations. How can we help you? What support do you need? But clear communication about our expectations for your job performance. That's what employees are saying. That's more than anything else. That's what I want to know is how how high up is that bar? What are your expectations? So that that was number one on the list. And I have to remind many of my clients, mostly business owners, of that on a regular basis. Anytime I have a business owner who says, yeah, I need to hire fill in the blank, whatever job it is, my first question of them will be, so what are your expectations for that position? What does success look like? in that position. And that should be clearly articulated in the job description. So that was one. Uh, Trace, the second thing, the, another one that I, was near the top that we're seeing more and more evidence of today in terms of importance is that it's really important for employees, particularly younger employees today, to understand the why behind their work. What's the purpose? What's the reason that I'm doing this job and in, in doing my job, am, am I contributing to something larger, something more important? 
So that suggests a couple of things. Number one, it suggests that as a company, we need to have a clearly stated mission, a purpose. Why does this company exist? And I'm sure many of your listeners have heard, you know, different examples of mission statements. You know, one of my favorites is the Ritz-Carlton Hotel, their mission statement, ladies and gentlemen, serving ladies and gentlemen. I love that. Yeah, that's one of my favorite examples because it's so simple. And yet so if you if, if any of you know, our listeners have ever walked into a Ritz-Carlton Hotel, you can you can just Feel. That's what this this business is all about, ladies and gentlemen, serving ladies and gentlemen. Well, think about it. Okay, so if that's the company vision, and I'm one of those employees, I've got a pretty good idea of how of what my purpose is as an employee, as a staff member, is I need to exemplify that mission. I'm one of those ladies and gentlemen, and it also suggests how I need to treat our customers. And our vendors and our stakeholders, they all want to be treated as ladies and gentlemen. So now I've got clear expectations, parameters around how I am to engage with anyone within this hotel. And so that's what employees said is, is help me understand how my job, whatever it might be, connects to a larger purpose, a larger mission. And and whether it's it's the Rich Carlton Chick Fil A does a great job of helping their employees understand how their jobs, whether you're working the counter, you're working in the kitchen, whatever it might be, how your job contributes to something larger, something more significant. And you know, Trace, it's interesting. You know, when I was a business owner, I didn't give much thought to purpose or mission, either at a company level or or at an individual level. I couldn't connect the dots between that and, and and more sales and more profit for my business. And yet there's a lot of research now that does that. The most recent research that I saw said that companies with a strong purpose, uh, a focus on purpose rather than a focus on profit, their results 384% better than the average company within their industry. Strong purpose, strong mission, outperform companies whose focus tends to be more on both top line and bottom line on the income statement, revenue or profit. 384% better performance, financial performance, by focusing on what's most important to employees. Tim, I know you've said it better than I'm going to try to misquote you but you've always said that unless people understand why they get up and come to work for you, they're not going to care. Yeah, it, until I know that you care, it's it's hard to hard to know what else might be important within the business. You know, Simon Sinek helped me more than anyone understand this idea of purpose. He wrote a book called Start with the Why, and in that book, the kind of he says it very early. He did a famous TED talk and talked about the book and. The most impactful thing I remember he said was this. He said, people don't buy what you do. They buy why you do it. People don't buy what you do. They don't buy your product. They don't buy your service. They don't care as much about that. They're more interested in why you do what you do, your purpose, your mission. And that really reinforced for me this the importance of not only, again, companies having a strong why, so to speak, but then also making it easy for their employees to understand their own why and how it contributes to that larger picture. Tim, is there a third question we should be asking? Yeah, the third one that comes to mind, and this one, uh, Trace, was the most interesting for me, and it was, do I have a best friend at work? Do I have a best friend at work? And I remember when I saw that uh, from the study and in the book, I thought, well, how could that be? How important could it be as an employee that I have a, a best friend at work, someone that I enjoy, you know, being around, you know, telling stories, you know, sharing, you know, uh, uh, you know what's going on with our families and what's going on with my golf game, and yet the research, number one, you know, the Gallup study clearly employees said I, I'd like to have a best friend at work. It's what's going to make me feel more fulfilled in my job. It's going to cause me to want to come back to work, even on days that I may not want to go to work. It also impacts my job performance if I have a best friend at work. 
So all the research, and there's even been some uh, more recent research that has pointed to the importance in terms of employee engagement, the importance of employees having a best friend at work. And yet, Trace, what's interesting is that I know very few companies that have specific strategies in place to foster relationships in the workplace between employees. And even saying that sounds kind of crazy, and yet the, the research is so valid about the importance of having these relationships at work. And, you know, some companies I find, you know, work on this, they'll, they'll form a, you know, a company soccer team, they'll have holiday parties, they will have, you know, Friday happy hours. But I don't think companies have even begun to realize the importance that they play in helping employees want to work together and building these relationships that at the end of the day, I think, you know, if an employee is sitting on the fence as to whether they want to take another job or stay where they are, sometimes the thought of, boy, you know, Trace is my best friend. And if I leave this job, I won't see Trace anymore. I think I'll stay where I am. I think companies underestimate the power of those relationships. Tim, what are some suggestions that business owners can do to foster relationships like that? Well, one is to not do what I see some companies do when they begin to see a relationship, you know, building. They'll say, oh, you know, we can't have that. The two of you going to lunch all the time or the two of you talking all the time. Uh, we're going to separate. You know, uh, Trace, we're going to put you over in sales. And Tim, we're going to put you in customer service. We're going to divide the two of you because clearly this relationship is not conducive to high performing, you know, uh, work environment when in, fa- when in fact it actually is. That's one thing is just recognizing, you know, the impact of, of, of relationships in the workplace. The second would be just looking for, for easy, I'll call it an easy win. Again, it could be, you know, just hosting different events, you know, at the workplace where employees are, are having opportunities to get together and have fun tell stories, laugh with each other. That's certainly an opportunity. You know, the uh, looking for opportunities to put employees in teams, allowing them to work together as teams, because I think when you work together on a team, that's a great way to build relationships with the people that I'm working with and getting to know them in a deeper sense, uh, finding out about their their education, how they grew up, about their families, their hobbies, their vacations. And then, you know, all of a sudden, you know, we've, we've built a relationship and my performance is going up, your performance is going up, we're holding each other accountable, we're supporting each other. And that's just the beginning of, you know, the positive aspects of these relationships. So, but Trace, to answer your question, I think it just starts with recognizing the positive effect of healthy relationships in the workplace. Tim, you mentioned performance, and most of us do reviews with our team members. You say don't do reviews. What should we be doing to make sure that we're inspecting what we expect? Trace, that's a great question. And one another thing that came out of the, the Gallup study, both 20 years ago and most recent, is that employees want to know how they're doing. They want to know, you know, am I meeting expectations? Am I exceeding expectations? They want to know how they're doing. They want feedback, but they don't want feedback, you know, once a year in a performance review or even semi-annual or even on a quarterly basis. On average, they want feedback every seven days. That's what the survey said. Every seven days, I expect to hear something from my supervisor as it relates to my, my job performance. So that's what I recommend to my clients is more frequent feedback on employee performance, because that's what employees want as well. So that's on one side of the equation. In terms of performance reviews, you're absolutely right. What I'm telling my clients is stop the madness, because performance reviews, again, annual, semi-annual, they don't work. And there's a, there's a ton of evidence, research that supports that, that they tend to have more of a negative impact on employee performance, because again, they're waiting six to 12 months to hear how they're doing. That's that's way too long. So stop doing the annual semi-annual performance review and instead instead do what my friend Gary Markle, who is an expert on this subject, 
and, and works with big companies, helping them make the change that I'm about to suggest from doing performance reviews to what Gary suggests, and that's doing performance previews. Well, you may say, Temple, that Tim, that's just a simple rearranging of words, but it's not because what we're doing is we're shifting in that annual meeting or semi-annual meeting, instead of talking about the past, which we should have been having those discussions again every seven days, in these meetings now, we're going to talk about the future. So Trace, you come in for your semi-annual performance preview, and I say, Trace, number one, thank you. You're, you're, you've exceeded expectations in terms of job performance. You and I look at your numbers every seven days. Today, what I want to talk about is the next six months and how can we as a company support you and help make sure you've got all the resources, the training, the budget to be equally successful going forward. How can we help you be more successful the next six months? So that's the beginning of a performance preview. And that's what I'm suggesting that you now begin doing in lieu of the performance reviews. It has such a better tone to it. Most likely the people know where they weren't performing. Do you point that out? Do you assume that they already know that? How do you handle something that you do need to help correct? Again, uh, the assumption is you and I have been talking about your performance on a regular basis, hopefully every week, every seven days. You're seeing metrics. You're seeing key performance indicators. There's full transparency in terms of your job performance. So it's, there's no surprise. You know how you're doing. So now when we get together for this six-month meeting, we don't need to talk about the past because you and I have talked about that on a consistent basis. What we need to talk about in this meeting is, is the future and how can we help you get to the next level? What do you need from me and from the company to be even more successful? That's what we want to talk about in this meeting. Tim, one of the stories that you shared with the Rising Tide Mastermind was about SeaWorld and how they train whales. What can we take away from that? Yeah, Trace, that's one of my favorite stories. I've been sharing that story for, for quite a while. And it also kind of brings back memories because I can remember as a child going uh, in, in, I grew up in Miami and we had Sea Aquarium and they had Shamu as well. And they had the porpoises that were well-trained. So this story always really resonates for me. And the, the idea is, you know, if, if I'm a whale trainer, if I'm training Shamu, and the idea is that I need Shamu to jump, say, 30 feet out of the water as a part of, of the performance, how do I do that? How do I train Shamu to do that? Well, if it's me or you, you know, we're going to take the, 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 the easiest path possible. So you and I are going to climb the ladder all the way up to 30 feet. We're going to grab a fish out of the pail. We're going to look down at Shamu, who's sitting in the water. And we're going to, we're going to say very simply, jump, Shamu, jump, with hopes that that, that that whale will leave the water elegantly, jump 30 feet, grab the fish from our, our hand, and the crowd goes wild. Well, I don't have to tell your audience, the chances of that happening are slim to nil not going to happen. No. What I have to do in train, I've got to train this whale. And what, what they do, what's interesting at SeaWorld and other places, when they train the whale to do this, they start off with the, 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 the rope, the training rope below the surface of the water. The rope is actually on the, at the bottom of the pool. And so then they encourage Shamu to go over the rope on the bottom of the pool. And when Shamu does that, pretty easy task at that point. Shamu gets rewarded. It gets a fish. It gets patted. It gets played with. We provide as much positive reinforcement as possible. We celebrate Shamu's performance. So then we, we raise the rope another foot, and we do the same thing once again. And we continue to raise the rope incrementally over time until we, at some point, we reach that 30-foot mark over above the water. Well, at this point, Shamu has gotten so accustomed to going over that the rope that 30 feet out of the water is no big deal. Because at each increment, we have celebrated Shamu's performance. It's gotten fed fish. It's gotten padded. But Trace, what's interesting, what the trainers do, 
every once in a while, Shamu doesn't quite make it over the rope, doesn't quite make it high enough to get a fish. And so what do the trainers do when Shamu doesn't perform? Nothing. The idea is that rather than, than penalize Shamu, rather than criticize Shamu, the best thing they can do is ignore that behavior because what happens, and Shamu is no different than you or I, we know what success, success has been defined for us, right? Jump over the rope. And if I don't make it, no one needs to tell me that I failed. I'm the first one to know that I have failed to meet your expectations. And I'm going to try to do better next time. That's just human nature. So we don't have to criticize Shamu. We don't have to punish Shamu. We're going to ignore that because Shamu already knows that uh, he or she has failed. And we're just going to try it again. And the next time around, more likely than not, Shamu is going to jump as high as we need it to. And we're going to be back to celebrating that performance. So the whole idea is that we celebrate success and we under-criticize failure. And to me, that's a really good prescription for leadership, whether it's Shamu or if it's your best employees. Over-celebrate, under-criticize. Tim, would you say the rope in this story when we bring it into business is the scorecard? Yeah, it's whatever expectations that we talked about earlier that we have set for this position at this time, that's where the rope is. And again, we've established that in the job description. We've had you know many meetings and conversations about our expectations. We have over-communicated you know, as a company what our expectations are. So there's no question what it is that we expect from you as our employee. Something I would like to ask you about, because I think people are still not knowing how to deal with it. Do employees stay home and work remotely, or does everybody now need to come back into the office? Uh, Trace, I'm really glad you asked that, because that's a question I'm getting from a lot of my CEO clients. You know, as COVID has, has seemed to have settled down to some degree, and employees uh, feel comfortable with the idea of coming back to the office, the question is, do we have them come back full-time? Do we have them come back part-time? Is it a hybrid approach? They work from home a couple of days, they come to the office a couple of days, or do we just allow them to, to, to work from home 100%? Now that between 30, 40% of employees are now working full-time from home. So that's the question that many business owners, big companies and small, are wrestling with is what what should I do? What what should I allow? Uh, what should I enforce? And Trace, what I have found is I think that in asking that, I think that they're asking the wrong question. And you know, so much about leadership is is not having all the answers, but having the right questions. And I think that the proper question is not you know home versus office versus hybrid. The more important question today, Trace, that I think business owners and leaders need to be asking is, do I trust my employees? Do I trust my employees? Because if I have full trust in my employees to do what's best for the company, to do what's best for them, to do what's best for their colleagues, they're going to decide, you know, should I be working from home? Should I go into the office? Should I be here on Mondays and there on Tuesdays? they're going to make the right decision. If I trust them to do that, I think nine times out of 10, they're going to make the right decision. I don't think I need to legislate that decision. I think that's the mistake that many business owners are doing. They're trying to make that decision for their people versus, again, if I've set the bar, if I've set expectations and I said, Trace, this is what I expect from you over this period of time. This is where the bar is set. I'm going to leave it up to you to decide whether you can achieve those results from home, from the office, a little bit of both. And then I'm going to support you in that decision because I trust you to make the right decision. And and what I see is, unfortunately, there's a lot of mistrust in the workplace. And as a result of that mistrust, then I, I figure, hey, I can't trust Trace to make that decision on his own. So I'm going to legislate that you come in on Mondays and stay home on Tuesdays and come in on Wednesdays because I don't think you can make that decision on your own. To me, that speaks of a very unhealthy organizational work culture. Well, you mentioned culture. Let's talk about that. How do you make sure you have the culture 
that your business thrives on when people aren't coming into the office? Yeah, that's a we could we could spend a whole afternoon on, <laughs> on that question. The idea of culture, at, you know, at the at the heart of any organization's culture are their core values. What is it that we believe in? Core values are those those fundamental principles that we've agreed that you know we navigate you know our business by. And ideally, we've identified you know a handful, five to seven core values for our company. And then it's those core values and, and our willingness to abide by those core values that then uh, drive the, the culture of our business, that determine you know, how people behave, how we make decisions, how do we interact with each other. So it's the core values that then uh, essentially create our organizational culture. So it starts with determining those core values. And then back to your question, Jim Collins, the famous author was asked a similar question. The question was, you know, how do I get uh, our people to buy into our core values and translate it? How do we get people to fit into our culture? And his response was really interesting. He says, you don't. You don't do that. He said, you hire people. You hire people who already possess those values. You hire people who already live by those values because you're not going to get someone to abide by those values if they've not already done so prior to joining your company. It's like if, if one of my core values is, is competition, you know, we want to compete, you know, at the highest level, you know, we compete really hard as a company. And if you're Trace, if you're not a competitive person, when I hire you to join my company, you're not just magically going to become competitive. It's just not going to happen. And so all of a sudden, you're going to be a bad fit on a team that's highly competitive. So I'm going to try to force you into a competitive environment when you're not a competitive person. That's a mistake on my part. That's not your mistake. And hiring you into my culture, knowing you're not a competitive person, that's, that's a bad hire. That's on me. So it starts uh, hiring people who share our beliefs, who share our values, who then will become a natural fit within our culture. Tim, with all of your experience working with leaders, what do you think is the most important thing we should be doing in today's environment? Trace, that's a that's another one that we could we could spend an entire day talking about, and I'd love love to be able to talk about it. But what comes to mind, and it's not my idea. I recently had the fortune of hearing Alan Malole interviewed. If you don't know Alan, if your listeners don't know Alan Malole, he was the CEO at Boeing aircraft for a number of years, very successful. And then in 2008, he was hired by Ford Motor Company to become their CEO. And for those of you who don't remember 2008, that was the beginning of the one of the worst economic recessions we've had in our lifetime, 2008. So Malole gets hired to take over Ford in 2008. At the time, they were running a deficit of $17 billion. They were on the brink of bankruptcy, as were the other car manufacturers at the time. You may recall Ford was the only car manufacturer, domestic car manufacturer, that refused to take bailout money from the federal government. GM, Chrysler, they took, they took large amounts of bailout money. Malole told the federal government to keep their money. We're going to do this on our own. We're going to turn around this company on our own. And he did so very successfully, a turnaround during the recession, turned Ford around. So that's the background. But he said something really interesting in this interview about leadership. He said one of the most important things as a leader, he said, is self-awareness, self-awareness, understanding who we are as a leader. What is it that we do well? What is it, you know, what are our weaknesses? What do we need to work on? Where are we deficient? He said it's, it's self-awareness is so important. And he cited a research that I'd heard before. There was a study that was done of very successful leaders, and they were asked to rate themselves on a scale of 1 to 10 on their leadership. Trace the average score that they gave themselves was a 4 on a scale of 1 to 10. And so what that suggests is that you know, the great leaders – you know, understand that, hey, on a, you know, I'm good, but I got a long ways to go. I can get much better. Self-awareness. And so Malole talked about things. He said, hand in hand with self-awareness is understanding that we all as leaders, that we all have blind spots. 
blind spots, meaning I can see what's in front of me. I can see to my right. I can see to my left. But I can't see behind me. What's going on behind me? What's a, you know, what are my blind spots? What am I not seeing? And so as leaders, we all have blind spots. We, we live with those blind spots day in and day out. We have to. And he suggested that you know, for leaders, understanding your blind spots, there are three questions that our employees are asking about us on a regular basis. The first question is, you know, re- relating to employees is, do they know who I am as a person? Do my employees know who I am? Do they understand what my values are? Do they understand what my principles are? Do they understand my history? Do they understand, you know, what's important to me? Do my employees get me? That's the first question that any leader needs to ask of themselves is, you know, to what degree, maybe on a scale of one to 10, do my employees understand me as a leader, as a, as a human being, as a father, as a manager? Do they get me? The second question he said, equally important, that leaders need to be able to ask relative to their employees is, do they know where I'm going in terms of directing this company? Do they know where I'm going? Do they understand the direction of this company, the vision that I have for this company, one year, three year, five year, 10 year? What's our big, hairy, audacious goal? That's what Jim Collins referred to vision as your your BHAG, your big, hairy, audacious goal. Do do my employees understand where I want to take this company? Have Have I effectively outlined for them the direction for this company? That's the second question. And then the third question I thought was maybe the, the, the most interesting of the three. Again, relating back to the employees, the leader needs to un- ask themselves, to, to what degree do I understand them, the employees? Not as employees, but as people, as human beings. To what degree do I understand them? What's important to them? Do I understand you know, their families? Do I understand where they've come from in terms of growing up? Do I understand where they want to go after they leave my company? To what degree do I understand them? So I would suggest, Trace, to your listeners, all of whom I'm sure are leaders within their companies, is to think about those three questions. And if they were to pose those three questions, what responses would they get from their employees? To what degree would their employees be able to answer those questions? To what degree do they understand their own blind spots? How self-aware are they as leaders? I think that's really important today for every leader. Tim, that's great. There's so many things I want to ask you. But what I'm going to ask you is back in 1992, you were a business owner living in South Florida, and you experienced Hurricane Andrew. What was that like? Whew, boy, that's... Now you're taking me, taking me way back. Well, you know, I, it was early in my career, and I'll, I'll flash forward for a second because if there's one character trait that I have found maybe most important for, particularly for small business owners, it's it's resilience. You know, what do you do when when you take a hard hit? When you take a hard hit? When your company takes a hard hit? How do you respond? Do you, do you get up and dust yourself off or do you stay on the ground and say, I, I don't think I can go any further? How resilient are you? How resilient is your company? Well, I had a test. I had a test of my resilience in 1992. I was a business owner in, in Miami, uh, Florida, specifically Homestead, which is a, a suburb of, of Miami, south of Miami. And in 1992, Hurricane Andrew came our way. And it was a terrible, terrible natural disaster. Uh, Thousands of people died, billions of dollars of damage, both to businesses and to homes. People were displaced for long periods of time. Um, I'll never forget it. I mean, we we were huddled down into my mom's hallway when the hurricane came over our heads and the winds were like 140 miles per hour. They were much worse uh, in, in other parts of the of the city. So I remember the hurricane had passed and we walked outside and there was total devastation. Houses just completely removed from their foundations. Cars, 100 yards from where they started. Trees disappeared. Just uh, total destruction. 
And uh, after a couple of days, I was able to to revisit my neighborhood where we lived, the subdivision that we lived in Homestead. And it, again, it was unrecognizable. I, I got lost trying to find my house because the, the landmarks that had been there before were no longer there. The, the trees and the houses and the street signs were all gone. And I remember, you know, finally getting to my house, getting to my street, parking the car, and uh, I couldn't say a word. I was dumbfounded. I, I just couldn't believe what I what I was seeing. I couldn't believe that such devastation could occur. And I was walking the neighborhood, taking a walk around, looking at you know this house and that house and this street, and just mourning the the loss that we had taken. And I came across and and thinking, how are we ever going to come back from this? Both as a family and, and as a business. And I came across a, a friend of mine who was doing the same thing. He was walking the neighborhood as well. And it was, it was nice to see a friendly face. And we shook hands and we compared stories. Where were you when the storm came over? Where were you? What was it like comparing stories? And, and then the next thing is, you know, well, you know, what have you lost? And well, I've lost my house. I've lost the business. Uh, good friends have, you know, have, have left. So you know, started to share our losses and bemoaning you know, the tragic uh, loss of, from the storm. And, and my friend said something in the moment, Trace, that has stayed with me forever. If he was here today, I would thank him again. Because after, after hearing of all my losses, he stopped me for a second. He, I paused. And he said, Tim, you know, at the end of the game, all the pieces go back in the box. At the end of the game, all the pieces go back in the box because up to that point, I assumed that all that stuff was mine. Car was mine. Furniture was mine. The house was mine. The business was mine. And I'd, I'd never entertained the idea that maybe all that stuff wasn't necessarily mine. Maybe it was just common goods. And now they were, they were no longer there. They were someplace else. At the end of the game, all the pieces go back in the box. And and that really changed my perspective on life going forward. That I was much le- up to that point, you know, as a young business owner, it was about collecting stuff, collecting assets, collecting a nice house and a nice car and a nice business. It was all about accumulating wealth and accumulating assets. And that storm, as difficult as it was, taught me a very important lesson that life is not so much about collecting stuff but more about enjoying what it is that we have, tangible and intangible. Again, with that understanding that at some point in life, all that stuff just goes back in the box, goes to somebody else. And that really changed my perspective about life. And it demonstrated to me that I I had some bit of resilience because we did come back. We rebuilt the house, rebuilt the business successfully and suggested that I had some some bit of resilience, thank goodness. Tim, you originally shared this story with me 15 years ago when I was in your Grow Smart class, and it profoundly impacted me. The way you tell it, you don't have to be there. It just, it just makes sense. And uh, the resilience that you showed getting back to where you are today, but then also how you tell that story, it changed everything for me. Because I got to say, as a small business owner, I was collecting stuff. And at the end of the day, it's about the relationships in your life. And that gave me words to better focus what was important. And I want to thank you for that. Uh, You're very welcome. Thank you. Well, Tim, I ask of all of my guests lightning round questions. And I've already asked you my usual lightning round questions. So I've got some new ones for you if you're game. Yes. (laughs) Yes. <laughs> <laughs> a hesitant yes. I'm sure you are going to do fine. And uh, the point values are triple. So uh, it's anybody's game at this point. Okay. I'm ready. All right. So your first question is if you had a magic wand, what would you change in the world? Magic wand. What would I change in the world? You know, Trace, my, I have a number of passions, but certainly. Uh, small business means as much to me, other than family, probably as much than anything else is is because I have I have so enjoyed you know the opportunity that I've had to be a small business owner and 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 then be a coach and a, a mentor to small business owners. So I think it would be that you know that it would be easier for people to be able to start businesses, easier to grow those businesses 
easier to enjoy the experience of a small business owner. I think as a society, as a country, as a government, I don't think we do it intentionally, but a lot of what happens doesn't always benefit small business owners, isn't always mindful of what's best for those entrepreneurs. And if I could change anything, it would be just a mindset that, that we should do more to support the men and women who choose to start their own businesses and and give jobs to the millions of people that wouldn't have jobs uh, otherwise. Tim, everybody has a superpower. How would you describe yours? Something that I have worked on over time, not something I necessarily uh, was born with, was I think is the ability to not only to, to listen, to be able to listen, and then to be able to question and much of what much of what I've learned in both those areas to listen and to question comes from my mom. She was fabulous, both as a listener. She would listen to me, you know, talk about anything without ever interrupting me or, or, or making me feel defensive. She was a great listener, and then she was she asked beautiful questions, and I didn't know it at the time. It wasn't until later in life that I, I noticed how good she was, how skillful she was in b- being both a good listener and, and a good questioner. And so those are two things that I have worked on a lot over time, and I've got a, a lot more room to go. But those are two things. I guess I pride myself, uh, the investment that I've made and, and the, the benefit that I've had from both of those. I would definitely agree with that answer. I am the recipient of your questions. I don't think you've ever given me advice. You've just asked some great questions. Oh, thank you. Tim, when the city of Sandy Springs erects a statue of you, what do you want the inscription to say? He cared. Very simple. He cared. Tim, I love having our regular meetings, and I love sharing the Scaling Up Nation with uh, a man that I am very proud to call my friend. Thank you for coming on the Scaling Up H2O podcast. Very welcome, Trace. Thank you for for having me back, and I feel privileged to to have you as a as a friend, and uh, look forward to just continuing to work with you much longer. Scale Up Nation, I cannot say enough good things about the individual that you just heard. I know you're probably sick of hearing me say that, but he has just been such an incredible force in my life. And as I've mentioned on other shows, as I mentioned on this interview, I don't think he has ever given me a lick of advice. He is phenomenal. Tim Fulton is a master of the question. And he digs in with the questions and he has solved so many of my issues with the questions. And Tim, I have told you this on this podcast. I've told you this in my office. You are not a good water treater. You don't know anything about water treatment, but it doesn't matter I know about water treatment. I know how to run a water treatment business. And the questions that you ask me allow me to think about whatever issue that is plaguing me at the moment in a different way. I never thought of it that way before. And then you'll ask me a question about that. And I go deeper into that. And by the time we finish our meeting, and this happens every single meeting, I've got ideas that I had never had around that issue. Nation, I would not have this podcast without Tim Fulton, uh, without my entire Vistage mastermind. I've been in that mastermind for almost 10 years, and then I decided to move on and start the Rising Tide mastermind, but it was in that Vistage group that I brought up the idea of the scaling up H2O podcast. And carefrontationally, they challenged me about doing this podcast. There was a lot of good, but there was also a lot of unintended consequences. Let's face it, it takes a lot of my time 
to do this podcast, and I don't try to stand still very long, so I don't have a lot of extra time to give. And it was that mastermind that helped me realize that this was a big commitment, and I could do it, but in order to do it the way it deserved to be done, I had to commit a lot more time than I originally put to this project. I went into this eyes open, and so many people within that group helped me get that way. And I think that's why we've been on the air for over five years now. It's hard to believe. So I hope that you have a group of advisors that you can take your issues to. Life is way too short to do it alone. And folks, if you are alone trying to do life, you are doing life incorrectly. I have always had a group of people in all aspects of my life that I have called upon to help me get through life. What are the blind spots that Tim and I were talking about that all leaders have? I'm not immune to that, but they're blind spots. I don't see them. My team tells me all the time what my blind spots are, and that's okay because I can get better. Or I can empower somebody to do what I'm not able to do, and it's most likely something that I don't want to do, and they love to do it. I didn't know these things until people pointed them out to me. So I hope that you have a group like this. If you do not, Consider Vistage. We've been talking about Vistage on this podcast, and we'll have how to contact them on our show notes page. And of course, there's always the Rising Tide Mastermind. The Rising Tide Mastermind is a group of industrial water treaters and companies that serve industrial water treatment companies. So we don't have to explain what it is we do in order to explain our problem. We can just simply go into whatever our issue is, and then that group of directors helps that person with that issue. And folks, it's not always technical. Most of the time, it's something they're dealing with personally. I myself have had some issues that I've shared with the mastermind that the mastermind has helped me with. So everybody has issues. There is no doubt about that. But how does somebody utilize their best self in order to solve those issues? Well, the way you do that, you can't do it alone. So I urge you to find a group that can help you with that. If you want to look into the Rising Tide Mastermind, it's scalinguph2o.com forward slash mastermind, and you can read all about the Rising Tide Mastermind. And by all means, check out Vistage and ask people around. I want you to find a group, not necessarily my group, although it might be the right group for you, but you need a group nonetheless. Earlier, when I was interviewing Tim, I did not remember all the numbers of the episodes that Tim has been on. So I have now looked them up so I can be a better podcast host at the tail end of the show than I was in the beginning of the show. So Tim was one of my very first guests. He wanted to help me with content when he helped me process the fact that I wanted to do a podcast. So episode 22, I introduced the Scaling Up Nation to Tim Fulton. And then this is my favorite episode. It's episode 92. Connor Parrish actually interviewed me and he asked me what my favorite episode was. And I answered it episode 92 because... Tim Fulton invited me to speak at his conference, and it was one of the most intimidating things that I've ever done, but it was also one of the most rewarding things that I have ever done. And there's a Maya Antelou quote, and I'm always misquoted, but it goes somewhere around, people won't remember what you said, they won't remember what you did, but they'll always remember how you made them feel. I love that quote. I hope that this show makes you feel a little bit better as you're driving from account to account. But one of the reasons that 92 is one of my favorite episodes is because I remember how I felt going through that process. And I want to steal a little bit of 92's thunder if you haven't listened to it yet. 
But Tim and I met in one of the meetings that I just shared with you that we have on a very regular basis. And I asked him about the conference that he puts on. It's called the Small Business Matters Conference. And if you're in the Atlanta area, he, heck, if you're even close by, you want to go to the Small Business Matters Conference because it is just action packed with all this business knowledge. And he does it in a TED Talk style format. And I asked him, I said, Tim, do you have all the speakers for your upcoming conference? And Tim said, I do. We have everybody booked. But then he kind of read into my question a little bit more. And he said, why do you ask? Again, Tim is the master of questions. And I let Tim know that I just always thought it would be an honor to speak at one of his conferences. So he looks down at his notes again. He said, Trace, I seem to have made a mistake. We have one opening. And he made a spot for me to speak at his conference. I will never forget how Tim Fulton made me feel that day. That is why episode 92 is my favorite. And then Tim came back on episode 114 and we spoke to the Scaling Up Nation about what the heck a mastermind was. Because I know that's a concept that not a lot of people know about. And Tim was very instrumental in me starting the Rising Tide Mastermind. And Tim started his mastermind as well. They have the same birthdays. And we compare notes with each other, and we try to always make sure that we're helping each other with best practices. So that was Tim coming on, helping the world know what the term mastermind means. So there you go. There are three episodes that if you need a bigger fix of Tim Fulton, episode 22, episode 92, and episode 114. Nation, I know you're always trying to keep your calendar up to date so you can keep that full of events that you, the professional water treater, can attend. Well, BOMA International is having their winter business meeting January 20th through 23rd in Scottsdale, Arizona. I was on the board of the Atlanta BOMA for three years, and I have to tell you, they are a very fine organization. So if you are in the building owner and managers association industry, which is mostly office buildings, this is something that you want to attend. You definitely want to make sure that they understand what it is that you do, but here's what you do, and here's how people failed when I was involved with BOMA. New vendor members would come in, and that's what I was. I was a supplier to that group. And they would complain that they wouldn't get extra business. And I have to say, our firm did very well with BOMA. And we really were successful in gaining new relationships. How did we do that? We didn't focus on what we could get. That is the bottom line whenever you are trying to join an organization. Your focus should not be getting. Your focus should be giving. And I did this with AWT, I did this with BOMA, and it paid back. People saw that I was willing to educate, that I was willing to give my time, my experience, and because of that, people reciprocate. So if you're a member of an organization and you're not involved, you're probably not getting out of that organization what you probably could get out of that organization. So I ask that you retune how you think about that. Now, of course, I just mentioned the Association of Water Technologies. And one of my absolute favorite things to do each and every year is teach in the Association of Water Technologies technical training seminars. So be on the lookout for me there. I hope to see you there. It is my favorite thing that I do. And we do that twice a year. So more information about the technical training seminars, you can go to our website and we will have all of that for you there. Of course, if you're wondering what we talk about at the technical training. Well, we do some sales training. In fact, I do the sales training. And what I've tried to put together is a compilation of not just how to sell, but why, why people buy, how to communicate. Uh, how do you know when it's a real objection versus you didn't cover something that you should have? And I don't like pressure sales. So this is about solution finding. If the customer has an issue, 
how can you help get them to the most perfect solution? So that is the sales training that we do. That's the first day. And then concurrently to the sales training, we also have ultra filtration training. So this is a very in-depth course if you are in the commercial or industrial market for reverse osmosis, ultrafiltration, EDI, and all the different membrane technologies, you are going to get a fire hose full of information there. But here's the problem. You got to choose between me and sales training or going to ultrafiltration. So you'll have to make that choice. Then we have two separate programs that run concurrently for the main bulk of the program. We have fundamentals and applications training. This is where we try to build the foundation of water treatment. And we have so many people that have been in the industry for either a short while, maybe just a couple years, or maybe they've been in the water treatment industry for years and they figure they don't need to take this foundations class. They say, oh, this is below me. Nation, we have painstakingly written this course material. So even if you know this information very well, you will learn it in a new way so you will be able to explain it better to your customers. It was Albert Einstein that said, to know something, you have to explain it well to a five-year-old. What he meant by that was if somebody had absolutely no context, could you explain it so they can understand? And I know a lot of people in this industry that are brilliant, but they cannot explain what it is that we do. That's a hard job on its own. So we help people do that. And we also help all the people that are newer in the industry understand our industry better, giving a foundation for the principles of water treatment. Now, what I recommend is that you take the fundamentals and applications training, whomever you are, and then you come back to the next time it's offered and you take the water treatment training. Now, water treatment training is designed to show that you are prepared for the certified water technologist examination. Now, let me be clear. That is not a course that teaches the certified water technologist exam. It just explains some of the information that you may or may not be tested on. So for people that are on that track, you probably want to take that course. Now, it used to be we offered the examination right after that course, but now you do not have to put yourself through that stress. You could go to one of the testing centers right by your home and you will do fine because the computer-based testing solves so many issues. I'm sure you've heard me speak on previous episodes where people have misnumbered their test exam. They have answered question 10 in question nine because they left nine blank and then they went all the way through the 200 questions and when they stopped, they were at 199 and they didn't remember where it was they made that issue. Well, you just can't do that with the electronic version. So it gives you lots of tools that you just didn't have when it was a paper version. So don't think that it's a bad thing that the AWT doesn't offer that examination in person anymore. It's actually much more to your benefit. Uh, also, the AWT is offering ASSE 12,080 training. So if you are interested in that, if you are in the water management plan business or you want to learn more about that, by all means, you should attend that training. And then, of course, we do the wastewater training as well. So there's so much that the AWT offers there's something for everybody, and I recommend you keep coming back until you take it all. You just can't get this stuff anywhere else. Nation, lots of notes from this show on our show notes page. Go to scalinguph2o.com. Go to this show, and we will have all of the notes for you. Just go to episode 286, and you will see all the material that Tim alluded to, but we didn't have time to talk about. 
And you will definitely learn a lot more when you go to our show notes page. Speaking of our show notes page, many listeners have contacted me and said, wow, you guys have done such a great job improving your website. Well, thank you for that. And thanks to the Scaling Up H2O team for all of the work that they have been doing to improve the website, to make all of the content that we've made available to you so much easier to find. So if you have not been on our website in a while, it's scalinguph2o.com. Nation, I love bringing this show to you. I love introducing you to some people that mean so much to me. I hope you have a great week and I'll have a brand new episode for you next Friday. Take care, everyone. 